All right, so this is the follow-up to the uh, guess the method uh, trick. And uh, some of you gave some very interesting responses out there. Um, I actually didn't fool a few of you. Some of you were very astute and you noticed a few things that were going on there. And probably um, your awareness was heightened a little bit uh, just by the fact that this was a bit of a, a challenge. And the assumption is that I would be doing something a little bit unusual. So um, let me first go through what the trick is designed to look like which uh, a couple of you caught on to. Uh, if I were to do the trick as it seemed to be presented, and this is from the performance uh, performer's view, um, it would look something like this. Uh, we would have the uh, deck, and I would uh, take out the uh, uh, aces. Uh, so we would uh, spread through the cards, pull out our aces. One, two, three, and four. Uh, and then we would place the aces into the deck, We're placing them in. Uh, we put one, two, three, four, and of course this is supposed to blatantly look like a strip out, a multiple shift uh, kind of situation. Uh, so the aces are, are sticking out, uh, and then uh, the way I presented it was supposed to be a little bit blatant. Uh, if I was doing this for real, uh, I would uh, uh, do the either the plunger principle or I would do a cover card. Uh, so the plunger principle would look like this, where you would seemingly square up the aces, but actually you'd be pushing uh, the rest of the deck uh, in while the top cover card is remaining in place and the aces seem to be squaring into the deck and under the cover of the right hand uh, you don't see the deck uh, moving uh, further to the right here uh, and then uh, as the deck is placed down under the cover of the fingers uh, you would then strip out the aces uh, plus uh, the top cards here for the first uh, the first strip those would fall to the table and then you would follow that up uh, with additional uh, cards on top so what happens is, is you end up with the aces on the bottom this was a, a kind of a slow sloppy version of it but that is what it's designed to look like is, is a multiple shift uh, then from here what you would do is you would do some false cuts retaining the bottom uh, and then, uh, so we still have our aces on the bottom, and then what would happen after that is a final cut, as if you're cutting into the middle of the deck. Uh, and this would serve two purposes. One is that it gives the illusion that you're cutting into a location where the aces are together, uh, but it also aids in the uh, operation of a uh, bottom deal. Uh, and it's sort of designed the way I presented it to look kind of like, a, quite frankly, a sloppy bottom deal. Uh, but it would look something like this, where you would push off the top card, kick out the bottom, push off, kick out the bottom, do that four times. So you've bottom dealt four cards. And then uh, the presentation, of course, at the end is that there are four aces. So that is what it's designed to look like. And I think um, I, I think that a couple of you were fooled by that and you, you kind of perceive that sort of design. Uh, however, this is a trick. Uh, this was a trick. I'm, I'm putting one over on you and some of you were aware to that. So I did not do that at all. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about um, what it is to fool people. Uh, there is, of course, a, a television show on now, has, has been running a few seasons, uh, run by the uh, magic duo Penn and Teller. Uh, and it's, it's a really great show, if not for the only fact that it's, it's making people more aware of um, contemporary magicians and contemporary um, acts and the people that they have on there are, are they, they tend to be very good uh, very good acts very good uh, illusions that have been well crafted uh, a little bit different I think from some of the other magic shows that have been on in recent years that have fairly um, I don't know fairly predictable plots fairly predictable and uh, previously seen and understood uh, stage illusions, uh, whereas Fool Us kind of gets away from that. You're seeing a lot of new innovative things that are really, really clever uh, and interesting and I think appealing to people who otherwise uh, could care less for magic. So uh, on this show, of course, the premise is, is that the performers are to fool magicians. 
Uh, and that's a pretty hard thing to do. And I've noticed that uh, even online with, um, you know, YouTube channels and such, that uh, this infatuation that whatever we present online needs to be able to fool uh, the magicians, you know, these, these uh, amateurs and professionals alike, but people who, who are, you know, paying attention to these tutorials and these uh, online presentations uh, are expecting to be fooled by everything, and they nitpick every little thing. Um, and I think that's a little unfortunate because it, it kind of gets away from what, uh, you know, common, I think, what this channel is dedicated to, uh, common illusion practice, you know, table magic, uh, amateur kinds of uh, tricks are geared towards, and that is to fool, uh, you know, regular folks who don't know the the, the basic slights that are, are used in many uh, tricks. So uh, I wanted to take a moment to kind of show you what it can look like to fool magicians. When you fool magicians, the, the key is not to be clean, the key is to do something unusual and use their understanding of informational practice against them. Which really the same thing for doing an illusion for a common, you know, person who's not in the know. Uh, you take very basic understandings of moving things around. You know, I put something on top, it must be on top. I put something on the bottom, it must be on the bottom. I deal cards from off the deck, they must be coming from the top. These are things that someone would normally understand to be true. And you use that information against them in order to fool them. Uh, and, and essentially you got to do the same thing when trying to fool a magician. Uh, I want to point to uh, uh, one person I saw recently on the show, uh, uh, Fool Us, has been back, uh, has actually been on the show a couple times. Uh, uh, Paul Gertner uh, does, uh, 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 has done three different acts on the show. In the first one, he fooled Penn and Teller. Uh, and one of the ways that he did that was that he used something that he marketed that they knew. Uh, and he put a twist in it. And a number of people who have been successful on the show have done that. Um, other people that are successful on the show uh, are doing things that are absurdly simple. That's another way to do it. So you do something that is a very, very simple uh, illusion with a very simple solution. And what happens is that because there's so many possibilities to the solution, you end up catching them off. They're not able to really nail down the one way that uh, the effect is accomplished. So very, very interesting you know, strategies to fool magicians, to use their information against them. Now, uh, Paul Gertner came back on the show again recently, I think this last season, not too long ago, and he did uh, an illusion which was a... Uh, uh, a card location sort of illusion, uh, and at the very end, he displayed a, um, a straight flush on the table in spades, and a royal flush on in spades. And uh, I, I actually caught out what he was doing the first time I saw it, and it was dumb luck that I was even thinking about the uh, solution that he he used. Um, I'm not going to tip off what he did. But I'll just say, if you're um, a fan of uh, uh, Shim Lim, uh, 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 who is a, a card uh, magician who does some very, very kind of extravagant-looking effects, uh, he he uses this particular method quite a bit. Uh, and Paul Gertner, who does not use this method, employed it. He he completely subverted uh, what the spectators who were in the know, uh, Penn and Teller, he, he subverted what they would expect him to do and did something that was completely different and unusual and out of the norm in order to pull off the effect. And quite frankly, something that was really easy to do. It was a very, very simple solution. Major, major cheating in order to do it. Uh, and uh, he did fool them. They weren't expecting it in that way. Um, I've seen some other people do that too. Richard Turner, uh, a couple seasons back, uh, did an effect uh, where he did something completely out of the ordinary for what they would expect him to do in order to accomplish it. Uh, so uh, what I'm doing here is kind of the same thing. Using what you know against you in order to uh, uh, present something that may go over your heads uh, if you weren't expecting it. You would expect one kind of solution, and I've actually done something very different, actually something much easier. Uh, a couple of you did hit on it. So uh, here, let's take a look at what I actually did. 
So this is the actual setup uh, for the trick. Uh, this is how I actually did it. Uh, I actually uh, used um, some extra cards in there, which I think uh, I think one of you, uh, two of you maybe have noticed in your comments, at least at the point of my uh, making this. Now, I think only one of you actually put all of the elements together, uh, not, not necessarily completely in, in the right order, but I think... Um, at least one of you figured it out. Either you just uh, were able to catch on to what was going on and deduce that I was putting one over on you, or you took the time to really analyze the video to, to discover uh, sort of, you know, frame by frame that uh, there, there were some red herrings in there. So let's take a look at this, uh, uh, what I did. And there's a lesson in this that we'll, we'll discuss when we get to the end of it. So the way the trick works is we start out uh, with uh, the deck. We take it out, take out the two jokers, put the box aside. Um, and uh, the, most, the, the most deceptive thing happens right at the beginning. Uh, and that's this right here. Uh, I put the deck down and I spread it out and I start uh, picking out the aces. Now this is the most deceptive thing because it apparently shows the deck... Uh, openly, and uh, you can see that you can see all of the cards. Now, what's deceptive about this is that there is actually a slug in there. I think one of you referred to the possibility that there were, there might be a slug of other cards, uh, and it's at the top of the deck. So when I uh, did my spread. Uh, I blocked off the first few cards, and just beyond that six of hearts, I have uh, four aces. So that's how this is accomplished. Um, I do not control any cards. Uh, all I do is I manage uh, through a method here to control a break, uh, and then we'll talk about that in a moment. So um, I pull out the aces. I did a shuffle. I think, from what I recall. Uh, and on the shuffle, all I need to do is I need to retain my top slug. And I also need to retain the bottom card. One of you caught on to the idea that the, the Ten of Spades may have been a breather crimp, and that is exactly what it is. So I did a, a shuffle, retaining my aces on top, retaining my uh, Ten of Spades. Uh, and then I spread the, the deck again, and then I insert the aces. Now, it really doesn't matter where they go, because I'm not actually going to control them and keep them. Uh, so once I did that, uh, I followed the procedures of what might be a, uh, a multiple shift strip out, uh, and I uh, uh, turned the deck face up, give some cover over here in a very obvious way, uh, and I pretend to do the uh, uh, plunger principle here uh, to, to prepare for the multiple shift. But actually what I did is I really did square those aces in. Uh, and then I uh, set the deck down, give it quite a bit of cover. Uh, and then I took a small block on the top, set a break, and in the motion of possibly stripping out those aces, I really just drop my top stock to the bottom. Then I strip off the bottom so that I get my uh, breather against those aces. And then I did a fair strip uh, going on there. Okay, so so far there's really no difficult moves going on. It's just a lot of uh, a lot of hiding and a lot of um, covert operation here, trying to present things that aren't actually happening. From here, there is a discrepancy. If you were tracking through where cards were at, you would notice uh, that we do end up in a discrepancy where I haven't retained uh, parts of the deck in this in the right place. Um, I do a triple cut which retains the order from where I started. Uh, and then what I did is I did one more cut where I retain about a quarter on the top and then uh, three quarters on the bottom and I bring that to the top. So that's the one discrepancy. If you're kind of tracking where things are going and if you assumed I did a multiple shift, you would note that the aces are not where they're supposed to be at this point if I was going to do a bottom deal at the end. Uh, what this does do though is it puts me in a place where I have um, my ten of spades in the middle, and then I can uh, go to my my cut here. I can cut off my at my my break at my ten of spades, and then I have a small uh, chunk of cards to deal here. Now again, uh, it is a benefit to bottom deal from a small stack. So that's kind of pointing in the direction of a bottom deal, but I don't actually do that. What I do, however, is I give you a very bad <laughs> representation of a bottom deal. Not very bad, but common common tells. Um, I'm holding my Erdnay's grip, of course. Um, 
And I actually do an Erdnay's bottom deal where I, you know, typically would flash that third finger. I, I don't really worry too much about those things. I'm the common magician after all. I just don't give a rip that that my, my third finger is flashing. Don't care because most people don't have a clue what you're looking at. Okay, only people in the know would know about it. Um, but I do one of these things such that it would be apparent to you. So I do kind of a quick and uh, uncomfortable deal of four cards. And while I'm doing that, I'm flaring out my fingers on the bottom each time uh, to fake that motion of a bottom deal. I set these aside, and then, of course, at the very end, I'm left with the reveal of my four aces. So, so that's what I did. Um, I'll probably do a few more of these in the future just to have some fun uh, where we'll, we'll try some different tricks, and I'll try to do, do a performant effect in an unusual way to see if I can fool you. But this is a point here. Uh, we would tend to think that no good magician in their right mind um, and in their right skill would do something like this, where you just use duplicate cards. I mean, really, if we wanted to make this uh, what we call too perfect, if we wanted to make this too it actually resets instantly, but if we wanted to make this too perfect, there's actually a theory about that, that a, a trick can be too perfect, uh, such that you can kind of divulge what the um, uh, method is, it would look something like this. I would uh, pull my aces out, and then uh, I would go through the similar motions as before, where I would set these aces back into the deck. Close it up, and I would square these in. And if you wanted to do the, you know, the ambitious card kind of effect, right, it would look like this and we would have all four aces on the top. So if I wanted to make it too perfect, that's a better effect. That's far more amazing to somebody uh, to see something like that happen than to see some cutting uh, and shuffling and dealing. Um, however, part of fooling a magician is to put in the red herrings that are in the vocabulary that a magician would know. Okay, so I just want to kind of set the record here. This channel, as I've said before, is not about fooling magicians. It's not about taking a technique that all magicians know and making it so clean that even they don't see it. That's impossible. That's absolutely absurd, really, to think in that way. Um, I can watch, and so can you, you can watch the very best in the business, and just because we know the vocabulary of what they're probably doing, we tend to know what they're doing, even if it's super clean. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're super clean. It doesn't matter if it's a little rough. It really just doesn't matter to us because we know the vocabulary. To somebody who's not in the know, it doesn't make a difference at all. One person doing the effect one way versus another person doing the same effect uh, in, in a different style is really the same effect to people who don't have the vocabulary. So uh, that's, that's my point. Uh, the second point is don't be afraid to do very cheap tricks. Don't be afraid to use duplicates. Don't be afraid to, uh, you know, force cars. Don't be afraid to do that. The only thing I would recommend is that if you're going to do that, make sure that you don't make something too perfect so that the method is automatically understood. Now the problem with this method for normal folks is that normal folks would probably assume that I'm using duplicates. Magicians wouldn't. Magicians would assume that I did some control, that I used some kind of skill in order to do that, when really the only skill at work was the fact that I know that magicians would expect it, so I did something different. Um, it, it, you, know, you have to think about who your audience is, and if you're going to be performing for magicians, you typically are going to do things that are off the wall and uh, much more simple than what they expect in order to, to pull one over on them. So anyway, that's a lesson. I had a lot of fun with this. Um, thank you for the comments. Thank you for the, uh, uh, you know, taking the time to, to, to leave a comment and try to sort out what you think is going on there. Maybe we'll have some fun with this, uh, these kinds of things in the future and uh, see what we can learn from them. So good, good luck with this little lesson here, and I wish all of you happy magicking.